Wendy Hammond Bennett is professor of history at Georgia State University. Her books include Neither Ballots Nor Bullets, Women Abolitionists and the Civil War, and A Strong-Minded Woman, the Wife of the Life <laughs> of Mary Livermore. Please welcome Wendy Hammond Bennett. Can everyone hear me okay? Is it louder? Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Is this working? Louder, okay. Is there a way to turn it up? Oh, okay. I'd like to thank the Atlanta History Center for inviting me to speak, and I would particularly like to, to thank the staff of the Keenan Research Center, two of whom are sitting there, for the help that they have given me over the last three years in the preparation of my volume. My office is located at 34 Peachtree Street, and it sits squarely in the middle of what was once Civil War Atlanta. One block to the east is the site of the Confederate arsenal, which at its peak employed more than 5,000 men and women. A block in another direction is the site of the Athenaeum, which was the city's premier theatrical and musical venue. And just beyond that is the site of the Trout House Hotel, the premier hotel in town, which welcomed Jefferson Davis on several occasions. Now today, most people who live, work, and attend classes in downtown Atlanta have no idea the historical significance of the neighborhood that we inhabit. There are some plaques on some of the buildings today that signify where things used to be in the 1860s, but these plaques are very small, they're old, they're weathered, and they are very easily missed. But over time, I have become more and more intrigued by the question, how did Atlanta's civilians cope with war? Did white people support, the Confederate, na support Confederate nationalism with enthusiasm? Did they find employment easily? Did they suffer from inflation and shortages? And what about the city's enslaved African Americans who made up an estimated 20% of the population before the war? What happened to them during the 1860s? And finally, what, what about Atlantans during the bombardment and the occupation of the city by the Federal Army? Well, with these questions in mind, I went off to the Atlanta History Center in the summer of 2006 to start digging around in the archives, and it was there that I first encountered the diary of Samuel P. Richards. Now, I wish that I could tell you that I discovered the Richards diary, but I didn't. Historians have known about this diary for quite some time. Uh, Franklin Garrett, who some of you remember, quoted from the Richards Diary, and military historians, people like Lee Kinnett, have also cited this diary over time. But when I read the diary in the summer of 2006, what really struck me about it was the range of topics that Richards talks about. He talks about military and political issues, but he also talks about a lot more. He talks about society, he talks about culture, he talks about religion, he talks about music, he talks about disease and health care, and he talks about family and marriage. I decided to um, take an excerpt of this diary, 1860 to 65, edit it, and publish it in order to make this very valuable resource available to a wider audience, and that's what I've done with my volume. Now, all told, the manuscript Richard's Diary consists of 15 cloth-bound volumes, uh, the diary begins in 1842, and it ends in 1909, 67 years of one man's life. I have published the years from October of 1860, just before Lincoln's election, until August of 1865, which is when the Richards family returned from uh, being refugees in New York City after the war. These are the years that I think have the greatest historical significance. I did read the diary back to the beginning in, 1860, in 1842, and I include an introduction to uh, my book that um, assesses Richards' life in the 20 years before the war, his outlook on a variety of subjects, this kind of thing. And then I skim the diary all the way to the end in, eight, in 1909, and I provide an afterword that gives a brief summary of what happened to Richards after the war. And then the period that I have uh, published, 1860 to 65, 
I have divided into seven chapters. Each begins with an introduction, which provides context and sets the stage. And then each chapter also has a lot of footnotes in it in which I identify the people, the places, and the events to which Richards refers. Well, let me tell you a little about Sam Richards himself, and then I'll spend most of my time talking about what his diary tells us about Civil War Atlanta, because I suspect that that's what interests you the most. Sam Richards was born in a small English village called Hook Norton near Oxford, in 1824, and he was the fourth of eight children born to a Baptist clergyman and his wife. The family moved to America in 1831 when Sam was six years old. They settled first in upstate New York in the town of Hudson, and then they lived briefly in Baltimore before moving to Georgia, where they lived for a short time in Forsyth and then moved to the town of Penfield. And at the time that they lived there, Penfield was believed to be an up-and-coming place and a center for Baptist learning and life. It's where Mercer Institute, later Mercer University, was started. It's important to understand that Sam Richards came from a family of creative people. His older brother, William Carey Richards, was a writer. And in the 1840s, he tried unsuccessfully, twice, to start literary magazines. Then he moved to New York. The next brother, Thomas Addison Richards, was a very talented illustrator and painter. And today, if you Google the name of Thomas Addison Richards, you will get a lot of auction sites because his paintings sell for a lot of money today. Sam's younger sister, Kate Richards DuBose, uh, married and moved to Sparta, Georgia. And she was the published author of poetry, short stories. And during the Civil War, she wrote song lyrics in support of the Confederacy. Well, Sam himself um, never really wrote for publication. He didn't think he was very talented. And instead, he poured out his thoughts in the form of a diary. Keeping a diary was a popular thing to do in the 19th century, though few people did it for 67 years. And of course, we as students of history are very much the rich, richer because Sam Richards did this. 67 years of one man's life and a lot of history of the city of Atlanta contained in these volumes. In 1848, Sam moved to Macon when he went into the bookstore business with his older brother Jabez, called Jabe. Uh, they had a bookstore in which they sold books, stationery, uh, sheet music, and pens and pencils and other gift items. In 1852, Richards married, married Sarah Van Valkenburg Richards, uh, and together they had ten children four of whom were born, four surviving children before, were born before the Civil War started. In 1861, a few months uh, after the Civil War began, Sam relocated his family to Atlanta. Um, his brother had already moved here, and his brother kept writing him letters saying that Atlanta, more than Macon, represented their best prospects for the future in terms of business, and Sam finally agreed and relocated his family here. Richards would live in Atlanta for the rest of his life and would keep writing in his diary until a few months short of his uh, death in 1910. Well, the first issue that really intrigued me about Atlanta is how did white Atlantans feel about the idea of a, a separate Confederate nation? And here, obviously, we can't know precisely because there were no pollsters wandering around asking people for their opinions. But we can get a sense of how fe people felt by looking at how they voted in the election of 1860. The election of 1860, of course, is the one that brought the Republican Abraham Lincoln to the White House, the anti-slavery Republican. And in that election, Lincoln faced three Democrats. The main Democrat, the official party nominee, of course, was Stephen A. Douglas. But there were also two breakaway Democratic candidates in 1860, John Bell, who was a pro-Union Southern candidate, and John Breckinridge, who was a pro-Secession Southern Democrat. Well, interestingly, in the city of Atlanta, John Bell, the Southern Unionist, carried a plurality of the votes. And if we add together the votes received by the Unionist John Bell, with those of the Unionist Stephen A. Douglas, the official candidate of the party, 
63% of people in Atlanta, voters in Atlanta, were in favor of unionist candidates. And the numbers were about the same for Fulton County as a whole. Now let's, by way of contrast, let's look at how people voted in Savannah. If we look at Chatham County, where Savannah is located, two-thirds of the voters of Chatham County voted for John Breckenridge, the secession Democrat. Well, what is going on here? Again, no pollsters, but what we do know is that Chatham County, Savannah, was an area dominated by a planter elite, whereas Atlanta, which was not a cotton-producing area, nor was Fulton County, was dominated by its business elite. And business people were decidedly skittish about the idea of separation from the North, possible war, and disruptions to business. And this, I think, probably helps to explain how they voted in 1860. Sam Richards absolutely felt this way. Right up until the time of Lincoln's election, he referred to secessionists as, quote, young squirts and politicians who aspire to office in a Southern Confederacy. However, once Lincoln was elected, support for unionism began to dry up, and we can see this with Sam Richards himself. The newspapers in Macon and, and Atlanta jumped on the secession bandwagon, and within a couple of weeks, Sam Richards was confiding in his diary, the Republican Party has succeeded in forcing on the South Abraham Lincoln as president with the expectation that we would submit and all would go calmly and quietly as ever. The whole country is in a ferment. On November the 12th, 1860, 500 people gathered at the Atlanta courthouse to hear speeches in favor of secession as, quote, the only adequate remedy, according to the Atlanta Daily Intelligence or newspaper, the only adequate remedy to the election of a Republican president. Many white Southerners believe that the election of this Republican president was an effort to uh, impose an anti-slavery agenda on the South. And when the state of Georgia did secede on January the 19th, 1861, Atlanta secessionists staged a lot of demonstrations. They fired cannons and rockets, and they illuminated houses, newspaper offices, hotels, and the railroad depot. And a short time thereafter, Sam's, two of Sam Richards' brothers-in-law joined the Confederate Army. Well, when Sam Richards and his family moved to Atlanta in October of 1861, they were part of a vast in-migration of people because Atlanta's uh, population began to grow dramatically with the start of this war. Because of its railroads, Atlanta became an important center for transporting agricultural products to the rest of the Confederacy. Privately and publicly owned factories began to churn out war materials to aid the Confederacy. And by the time uh, General Sherman and his army arrived in um, the fall of 1864, it was estimated that Atlanta's population had grown to 22,000 people, more than doubling the pre-war population. Sam observed a city that was growing so rapidly that housing was hard to find, and this is 1861. And so he and his family moved in with his brother Jabez on Washington Street. Um, Sam's family of six, Jabez's family of four, and Washington Street, just to digress briefly, is the street that runs in front of the state capitol, but during the Civil War this was sit at the site of City Hall, and if you can envision that block across from what is today the state capitol, then City Hall, on one end of that block is Central Presbyterian Church, which was there then, different structure, at the other end of that block was Second Baptist Church, which was the church home of the Richards family. And a few blocks beyond that, down Washington Street, was the home of Jabez Richards. Now Sam and Jabez and their wives uh, regarded this as a temporary arrangement. Uh, but housing was in such short supply that the families ended up staying together for most of the war. In 1863, um, Jabez's wife died of tuberculosis. He moved with his kids to the country, and Sam took over the house as renter, and then he leased out rooms to a variety of renters because there were always people looking for, for space. As an industrial center, Atlanta really took off in 1862 because with the fall of Nashville and the fall of New Orleans, uh, Atlanta's, Atlanta's geographical importance as an interior city, one that was away from the coast, away from the Union Navy, away from a major body of water, made it all the more special. 
And so lots of factories started setting up here, and of course the most important of them was the Confederate arsenal. All kinds of things were manufactured here, knapsacks, cartridges, saddles, canteens, sabers, percussion caps, cannon. Uh, estimated 5,500 men and women worked in these uh, shops. The uh, Confederate Quartermaster's Depot employed several thousand women as seamstresses. So this is a huge employer of people, and again, people are flocking into this city to get work. Well, the same factors that made Atlanta advantageous as an industrial center also made it a key location as a hospital center. And uh, after the fall of Fort Henry and Fort Donelson in 1862, uh, wounded and uh, ill soldiers became, began to be uh, transported here by rail. Sam estimated that there were already three to 4,000 wounded men here as early as March of 1862. All manner of buildings were turned into hospitals, churches, schools, hotels, private homes. Sam's wife, Sally, began working with a group called the Ladies' Soldiers' Relief Society, and they took the women of the Second Baptist Church in conjunction with this group, took over the volunteer efforts for one of the hospitals. She also sewed what were called comforts, which were like ersatz blankets that women would make, make out of um, household linen, old tablecloths, old blankets, coverlets, etc., that they would donate. And then in June of 1862, the Confederate government began uh, building a vast hospital complex here uh, near the railroad called Fairgrounds Hospitals. And Fairgrounds Hospitals would uh, care for thousands of Confederate soldiers, mostly from the Western armies during the war. Well, Sam Richards felt sadness and pity for the city's wounded and ill men, but he also felt nervous uh, because the newspapers, the Atlanta Daily Intelligencer and the um, Southern Confederacy would run lists of the dead, and they usually had this headline, the dead on a hospital-by-hospital hospital basis, and soldiers' individual names, and then what killed them. And as Sam read these articles and saw the prevalence of things like typhoid fever, consumption, and so forth, he became nervous about uh, his children contracting these diseases. When scarlet fever swept through Atlanta in January of 1863, Sam and Sally Richards tied asafetida bags around the necks of their children, and I had to look this one up in the dictionary. Uh, apparently this was an old folk remedy. It was a, a, a vegetation in the carrot family, and so these poor kids walked around with rotting carrots around their necks uh, because their parents thought it would somehow protect them from disease. But the disease that Atlantans feared more than any, and certainly that the Richards family feared more than any, was smallpox. And smallpox hit the city for the first time in the fall of 1862. And uh, although the city made sincere efforts to stamp it out, they were never successful. And so problems with smallpox kept recurring in Atlanta throughout the Civil War. And this time, Sam didn't take any chances on folk remedies. He had his family vaccinated. And in fact, in 1863, the mayor of Atlanta, James Calhoun, uh, ordered the city divided into its five wards and sent um, doctors door-to-door uh, -to -door throughout the city to try to vaccinate every person in Atlanta. And this happened with the Richards family in February of 1863. And then the doctors came around a second time to extract fresh vaccine material from those recently vaccinated to use it on people in the future. But again, sadly, they were never able to truly eradicate the disease. It kept coming back. Well, despite the uh, presence of so many uh, wounded and sick men in their presence and all the other vicissitudes of war, the Richards family managed to have some fun. Sam and Sally Richards liked to go to the theater, and they were particularly fond of a traveling group called the Queen Sisters and Palmetto Band. And the Queen Sisters were a group of young women thespians from Charleston, South Carolina. They traveled throughout the South, Mobile, Savannah, etc., and they came a number of times to Atlanta during the Civil War. They charged 75 cents a ticket and half price for children and slaves. And they sang, they danced, and they acted, and they did so in a way that incorporated wartime themes. So their, their theatricals would have uh, titles like The Young Widow and the Conscript. 
The Richards children, of course, played as children always do, and their son Arthur loved to go and watch the train, go to the rail depot and watch the trains coming and going, and there were lots of trains to watch coming and going in Atlanta during the Civil War, and Sam often recorded in his diary about what the family ate and did to celebrate holidays. For example, in 1862, he wrote about the family enjoying a fine rooster for Christmas dinner, and of course, there were presents for the children. Well, Sam Richards could afford rooster dinners, theater tickets, and gifts for his children uh, because he was making a lot of money in the bookstore that he and his brother ran. In January of 1862, he wrote, business is pretty good and the profits are splendid on what we do sell. Now, Sam Richards did not record, at least not in very many details, how he managed to keep his bookstore stocked during the Civil War, but it is known that his best friend in Atlanta was the blockade runner, Sidney Root. A pre-war dry goods merchant Uh, Root sang tenor to Sam's baritone in the Second Baptist Church Choir. Um, He and his partner, John Beach, they had a dry goods store before and during the war, um, began a blockade running uh, operation out of Charleston, South Carolina, and after Charleston was shut down by the Federal Navy, they ran it out of Wilmington, North Carolina, until it was shut down. And intriguingly, in 1893, Root wrote a memoir for his children, unpublished, it's 30 or 40 pages long, in a typescript form, and it's one of the many treasures in the Keenan Research Center across the way. It's closed today, you can't read it. But he estimated that he, that at the peak of their operation, they ran between 19 and 21 ocean steamers. In July of 1862, the Atlanta Daily Intelligencer newspaper referred to Root and Beach as a successful venture of importers. And they noted, our true southern women will doubtless be ambitious to secure a dress. And that month, Sam Richards recorded in his diary that Sally, his wife, had procured a calico recently smuggled on uh, Ruth's ship, the Memphis. Well, by 1863, Sam Richards was earning profits that were truly unimaginable to him before the start of the war. In February of 1863, he wrote, some of our profits are enormous truly, including ink pens that he and Jabez sold for $28 that had cost them 75 cents. Sam and Jabez began investing their money. They bought lots, city lots, and they bought acreage in the country, including a farm southwest of Atlanta called Pleasant Hill. In December of 1862, Sam took the momentous step of buying his first slave. Her name was Ellen, and he estimated her to be 13 years of age. Uh, She had moved with the family to Atlanta in 1861, and for several years previous to that, he had rented her services from her owner in Macon. Sam was immensely proud of being a slave owner because ownership of slaves bestowed a type of prestige on a southern gentleman that was really unmatched by any other form of property ownership. The month after uh, he bought Ellen, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And that proclamation uh, freed Ellen, at least in theory, though not, of course, in fact. Sam called it a dreadful edict and he predicted that after the war ended, slaves would be even more valuable as the price of cotton went up. Well, while profits were good for merchants like Sam Richards, inflation and shortages gripped the city of Atlanta, and everyone was affected. Unable to afford wheat flour, the Richards family made biscuits out of ground rice. Sam paid $10 for five chickens so that his children could have eggs, and he paid $160 for an old cow so that they could have milk. Jabez Richards, who had moved to this uh, farm that the brothers bought, rode into town on occasion on what Sam called his $900 mule. (laughs) Nevertheless, during the first half of the war, white uh, civilians in Atlanta showed strong support for Confederate nationalism. Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, spent the night here on the way to his inauguration in Montgomery in February of 1861. He spoke from the balcony of the Trout House to an audience estimated at 5,000 people. And in his speech, 
He reminded uh, Atlantans of the North's abolition fanaticism, which, according to Davis, has driven us to this step of secession. He was interrupted frequently by what one news newspaper called wild applause. In October of 1863, Davis came again, this, try, this time to try to fix the command problems in the Army of Tennessee, which he famously did not succeed in fixing. Uh, but one evening during his uh, fall 1863 visit, Sam Richards opened his front door to find Jefferson Davis and a military aide standing on the porch. Davis had come to pay a call on a woman to whom Sam was renting a room. Uh, her name was Mrs. McLean, according to his diary. Uh, her real name was Margaret Sumner McLean. Her husband was a high-ranking Confederate uh, staff officer, and the two of them were close friends with Jefferson Davis and his wife, Verena. Sam didn't mention it and probably didn't know it, but uh, Margaret Sumner McLean was also the daughter of a major general in the United States Army, Edwin V. Sumner, who commanded troops at Antietam and elsewhere before retiring from the Union Army. In 1914, Mrs. McLean would publish a short memoir of her wartime experiences in Harper's Weekly. Well, Sam Richards, once a reluctant secessionist, came to support the Confederacy with enthusiasm. He showed his personal commitment to the Confederacy by participating in days of fasting, prayer, and humiliation that were, caused, uh, that were called by Jefferson Davis by the governor of the state, Joe E. Brown, or in some cases by the mayor of Atlanta, James Calhoun. And on these days, Richards closed his bookstore, attended church, and refrained from eating. He did not join the military, believing himself to be too old, he turned 40 in 1864, and too unsuited to military life. And in fact, he went to extraordinary lengths to avoid serving in the military and evading the draft. And I'll leave it at that, but if you want to revisit that question during the q and I'll be glad to do so. Like many Southerners, Sam Richards saw God's hand behind early military victories for the Confederacy. He attributed the South's victory at First Manassas to, quote, the direct interference of God. As an avid reader of Atlanta's newspapers, the Daily Intelligence or in the Southern Confederacy, he often read early reports of military um, battles and took them at face value, only to learn later that the truth lay elsewhere. For example, he wrote in his diary that not only did Robert E. Lee win the, the Battle of Gettysburg, but he also took 40,000 prisoners. And then he had to uh, rewrite that one. Atlantans were devastated to learn of the loss of Vicksburg. Um, th this was a terrible loss, and everyone knew it at the time. And for a period after the fall of Vicksburg, John Pemberton, who had been the Confederate commander at uh, Vicksburg, lived in Atlanta, a guest of Sam's friend, Sidney Root. Pemberton hoped that there would be a court of inquiry that would be convened in order to exonerate him of any personal culpability in the loss of the um, stronghold at Vicksburg, but such a court of inquiry was never convened, and he eventually left. Well, as the war began to turn against the South militarily, Richards' faith in what he saw as God's justice wavered but never broke. And uh, as close as six days before the surrender of Robert E. Lee to General Grant at Appomattox, he wrote in his diary, I cannot believe that an unjust and bloody program of the North will be allowed to be carried out to completion by a righteous God. The war's cost weighed very heavily on Richards, who was a genuinely religious guy. And one of the most moving passage in the, passages in the diary occurs in May of 1864, when Sam took his family out to visit what was then called City Cemetery and later became known as Oakland Cemetery. This is what he wrote on May 15, 1864. Father and mother came in and dined with us. After dinner, Sally and I and the children rode out to the cemetery. The saddest sight that I have ever seen is the acre of fresh dug graves that are filled by dead soldiers, the result of this terrible war. Not a blade of grass left growing there, and still the work of destruction goes on. Well, Richards and other Atlanta citizens love to follow the exploits of partisan rangers, those swashbuckling cavalry types who wreaked havoc on the Union military during the war. 
They loved reading in their newspapers about Nathan Bedford Forrest, but they had a particular affinity for John Hunt Morgan. And Morgan made several trips to Atlanta during the war to recruit men for his cavalry and to raise money. And Sam was proud to write in his diary that one of his fellow parishioners at Second Baptist rode with Morgan. Well, the handsome Morgan was captured and held in a federal penitentiary, but late in 1863, he escaped. He tunneled out with the help of friends, and through a series of disguises and aided by various people, he managed to get out of Ohio and found his way to Richmond, where he was received with adoring crowds. This is now late in the war, and things are going badly militarily for the Confederacy. And after appearing in Richmond, he came to Atlanta because Atlanta, by this point, had become second only to Richmond itself in importance for the Confederacy. And so he's trying to buck up morale. He goes to Richmond, and then he comes to Atlanta. And on the morning of February 6, 1864, the newspapers announced that Morgan is going to appear that day. And so the, the huge throng of people shows up at the rail station to greet Morgan, his wife, and staff, and to escort him to the Trout House Hotel, where he gives an address from the balcony, receives the adoration of the crowd. It seems to give people hope that the Confederate cause can still live on. Now, Sam didn't know it. No one knew it. But the appearance of John Hunt Morgan would be the city's last major celebration of Confederate nationalism. The day before his arrival, the Atlanta Daily Intelligencer announced as a virtual certainty that Atlanta would be the object of the Federal Army's spring campaign. And indeed, of course, it was. By 1864, Atlanta's civilian population lived a perilous existence. Inflation and shortages afflicted every household. In 1861, Sam had complained when coffee reached 50 cents a pound. By 1864, he wrote, you couldn't find coffee for $15 a pound. Butter cost $8 a pound, syrup cost $20 a pound, or $20 a gallon, according to Richards, and sweet potatoes locally grown cost $16 a bushel. Sam and his family lived off produce they grew in their garden, but of course, Atlanta's neediest citizens lived in truly dire straits. And to place this in perspective, a woman working at the arsenal could expect to earn about $15 a month. A Confederate private could expect to earn $11 a month and sweet potatoes cost $16 a bushel. Everyone complained about lawlessness. Problems with theft, counterfeiting, drunkenness, and lewd behavior <clears throat> filled the newspapers. And one nurse who traveled with the Western armies called Atlanta the most wicked place in the world. <laughs> Fed up citizens tarred and feathered a suspected thief who preyed on guests at the Trout House Hotel. But Atlantans especially feared slaves and the possibility of slave uprising and were quick to blame slaves for real and imagined um, cases of lawlessness. Before the war, slaves made up 20% of Atlanta's population, and we, I don't know exactly what percent they made up of the wartime population, but we, what we do know is that they were leased out by their owners. They were impressed to work on the fortifications that were supposed to protect the city, and then some of them were also leased out to work in factories and in hospitals. As time went on, more and more slaves escaped. One historian who has studied runaway slave ads in newspapers found 36 such ads in 1862, 81 in 1863, and 153 in 1864. And that's just the people that advertised for their runaway slaves. Sam's a diary conveys a sense of unease about slavery and the fear that what he called slave impudence should be dealt with a firm hand. His diary records two instances where he whipped his slave, Ellen, for real uh, or imagined acts of stealing. In one case, he accused her of using some of her mistress's perfume, and in the second case, for stealing a thimble of thread. He believed that his brother, Jabez, was not firm enough in dealing with his own slaves. Well, at the same time that civilians struggled to cope with worsening uh, conditions in the city, they also, of course, feared the advance of General Sherman's army. Between March and June, they held out some prospect of optimism, but when Sherman's army got past Kennesaw Mountain in late June, they began to think maybe things were not going so well. 
Uh, but the real turning point came when the military authorities started to evacuate the hospitals. And that happened on, on or about July 6, 1864. And it's really at that point that metropolitan Atlanta began to implode. Thousands of civilians left the city. Sam called it a complete swarm. The city council stopped holding minutes or meetings. The court system stopped functioning. Both of the city's newspapers packed their presses and moved to Macon, saying only that he doubted the Yankees were quite as bad as they are said to be. Sam Richards stayed, along with an estimated two to 5,000 civilians. So roughly 80 to 90% of people left. He stayed. Richard soon had reason to question his judgment, however, because by staying, he placed himself and his family at risk. By later in the month of July, of course, the federal army had started shelling Atlanta. After a federal shell landed on their street, throwing a hail of gravel onto the second story windows, Sally Richards pulled the children's mattresses behind the chimney to try to protect them. Her <laughs> husband, meanwhile, began digging a pit or gopher hole, a, a homemade bomb shelter in the cellar. Nonetheless, the family had some close calls. A shell weighing 20 pounds struck the Richards bookstore. A shell fragment landed in their backyard, and a shell passed through uh, Second Baptist Church. Some Atlantans lost their lives. On July the 7th, Richards wrote, a gentleman and his little girl, 10 years of age, were both killed in bed by the same shell last week. A reference to J.F. Warner and his daughter, who lived near the Atlanta ga gas works. Sam estimated that 20 people died during the bombardment of Atlanta, and his, that figure that he came up with is the one that historians tend to use as the authoritative figure. And historians estimate that one to 200 additional people were wounded during the bombardment. When Sherman's army finally arrived on September the 2nd, Richards remarked that the scene would have required the pencil of Hogarth to portray as soldiers, civilians, and African Americans looted the downtown business district, including the Richards store. In the coming days, he would marvel at the events unfolding around him. An abolition preacher from Indiana took over the pulpit of Second Baptist. Yankee soldiers claimed City Hall for their provost guard headquarters. And slaves, previously owned by Sam and Jabez Richards, celebrated their liberation. Our Negro property has vanished into air, Sam wrote in his diary complaining as well of the impudent airs the Negroes put on and their indifference to the wants of their former masters. Ellen, the young slave he had purchased in 1862, disappeared from the pages of his diary and presumably from his life. Well, William T. Sherman expelled Atlanta's Confederate civilians from the city, and Sam and his family, hoping to escape the war zone, traveled to New York City, where they both had family. They were able to do this because Sam had managed to hold on to a small amount of gold, and they also raised funds by selling furniture to some federal officers. Uh, this period, when they lived first in Louisville and then in New York, comprises the last chapter in my volume, and it does contain some interesting information, including efforts by Confederate saboteurs to launch a full-scale um, arson attack on the city of New York. They set a dozen or more fires in major hotels and other public buildings, ostensibly in um, retaliation for the federal damage done to Atlanta. And subsequently, there was a crackdown on Confederate refugees living in New York. Unable to receive mail from his family in Georgia, Sam eagerly sought news about the city from newspapers in New York. And he did find one account in the New York Herald on December the 8th, 1864, allegedly based on an eyewitness account. And this, according to this account, there were only 675 people left in Atlanta, uh, roughly 600 of them women and 15 to 20 of them children. The article also noticed the destruction of all the railroad depots, foundries, railroad shops, government works, and mills torched by Sherman's departing army, and identified individual neighborhoods and homes that had been burned. Sam was relieved to learn that the home of Jabez Richards had survived. Well, Sam Richards and his family returned to Atlanta in August of 1865, and over the years he prospered. 
Richards, who so carefully and effectively chronicled the city's tumultuous Civil War years, became part of what made post-Civil War Atlanta an economic success story. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to try to answer questions if you have any. Yes? I'd like you to return to the conscription issue. Oh, okay. Um, well, as you no doubt know, in, in both the North and the South, it was possible to evade the draft by buying a substitute, and that's what he did first. And, of course, we have these wonderful military records, so it's easy to find out what happened to his substitute. The guy lasted a few months and then deserted. Um, so he's gone. <clears throat> but then they kept cracking down on, on people who were evading the draft. And so the next thing that Sam did was to uh, become a typesetter because people who were typesetters for newspapers were able to avoid military service. And so he did that. He worked on a publication called The Baptist Banner. And then to try and shore up, again, his chances of avoiding military service, he uh, purchased a newspaper uh, with his brother called The Soldier's Friend, which was a news, an existing newspaper, and it was designed to raise morale in the Confederate Army. And Jabez and Sam Richards edited and published this journal. And then finally, very late, late, like May of 1864, uh, he was able to get an actual um, draft deferment. So he, he got an official statement saying he did not have to serve. And so as the Yankees are entering uh, Atlanta, a friend comes to the back gate and says, do we want to go with the militia? And Sam says, no. And so that's it. He does not join even the militia. He does not participate in any way. And he seemed to have no conflict, no, absolutely no conflict in his own mind about being a supporter of the Confederacy and being a draft dodger. And in fact, the, uh, one of the scholars who read the manuscript, my manuscript for the University of Georgia Press, said he'd never seen such a complete record of a Confederate draft dodger as this one. And then he goes, he goes up to New York and he is in actual danger of being drafted into the Union Army. <laughs> and the U Union recruiters come to his boarding house and they take down his information, but they wrote his name down wrong. They wrote it as Richard's son. And that may have been what, what uh, kept him out of the Union Army. So he didn't want to fight, that's for sure. Alan. He was very saddened by that. Um, he, he, was, he just felt full of sadness. And I think he realized, as more moderate Southerners did, that Lincoln was not, uh, that he was a more moderate influence and that perhaps the lack of having Lincoln in the presidential chair during the post-war period could be a bad thing. So he was not happy about the death of Lincoln. Yes? You know, I don't know the answer to that question, and if, if, here's what I do know, and if any of you know more, here's where I would love to be able to talk to Franklin Garrett. Here's what I do know. In 19, he died in 1910, and in 1923, a woman named Ella May Thornton, who was state librarian or archivist, I'm not sure which, published an article in the Atlanta History Bulletin saying that the Richards Diary had just become available, and I don't know what that means. And she wrote a brief description of some of the contents of the diary. Then fast forward to 1937, the uh, local historian and artist Wilbur Kurtz uh, commissioned, or someone acting on his behalf made a, a typescript. No footnotes or anything, no um, background material, but just a typescript of the wartime years of this diary, and this is dated 1937. Wilbur Kurtz was a, a consultant on the movie version of Gone with the Wind, and I do not know whether it, the timing is relevant. 1937 typescript, 1939 movie, I don't know. Um, I don't know where the diary was housed between the 1920s and the 1960s. Um, Interestingly, the Kurtz typescript is it's a pretty accurate rendition of the diary, except on those rare occasions when Sam refers to something a little bit scandalous, like somebody having a drinking problem kind of thing. It appears in the typescript as a series of X's, no name. <laughs> uh, but the only thing I know definitively is that the, um, the diary was deeded to the Atlanta History Center in the 1960s, 
by the S.P. Richards Company, which is still around. Um, today is the oldest business and continuous operation in Atlanta. It, it is now a wholly owned subsidiary of Genuine Parts Company, but it's, it, instead of a retail bookstore, it's now a paper goods company. And they formally deeded the diaries plus um, a small collection of family materials, but the diary is the most important part of that collection. And if there are descendants of Sam Richards, uh, and I'm sure that there are, they have not made contact with this facility or with me, and I would love to have some kind of contact with them, but it was the, the company and not the family that formally deeded the, the diaries. Yes? What was his attitude toward the state government? You mean like uh, Joe Brown and... Well, like a lot of, of white people in the South, he enjoyed things when things were going well for the Confederacy. He was very happy about that. But over time, he became more and more resentful of taxes, and he was deeply resentful of conscription. He just didn't think he should have to serve, and he thought it was outrageous that he would be asked to do so. And so he, he built up resentments about that. Sue. Right. Any sense in the diary that I mean, was he annoyed that other people were doing it? But he, I mean, how did that he didn't seem to feel guilty about it. Um, <laughs> you know, if he were keeping people in bread, maybe he were more staple kind of things. Sam Richards worked hard all his life. I mean, he was kind of a hustler kind of a guy, and he really worked hard. And when he had the bookstore in Macon, and he never owned anything until he moved to Atlanta. No slaves, no house, no business. He just worked hard and rented and took turns peddling books in the countryside. And so he thought that he had earned the success that was coming from him, to him and that he was a savvy businessman and it was finally going his way. Yes? I'm curious about the diaries themselves. How many volumes? And did he write every day? And about how much did he write every day? He, there are 15 volumes, and happily he has good handwriting. Uh, otherwise, I would never have survived. He did not write every day. It, um, sometimes he, well, sometimes he wrote every day, but some, occasionally he'd go as long as a month. He usually wrote at least once a week. And the diary um, entries are much fuller, more interesting, and more interpretive in the period from 1842 to 1865. Once he came back to Atlanta, I mean, they kept having more children. He had eight surviving children. He had a business to run. I think the man was just busy. And in the post Civil War years, his, his diary entries are just not as rich as they are before the war. I mean, I think historians find things worth noting in the post-war period, but uh, the, the, the best part of the diary is the earlier part. Yes? Out of all the reading you did in the diary, what was the most surprising thing to you? Uh, well, it, it's hard to understand how someone could be such a gung-ho Confederate and not will, be willing to fight. I mean, that, that's a hard one. I, but I guess the thing that, even more than that, what really surprised me is why in the world the man didn't leave town. Because uh, military historians have suggested that the, the people who didn't leave were the people who didn't have anywhere to go. And he had lots of places to go, uh, but he didn't choose to go. And I can't figure that out. As well as I know Sam Richards, I can't figure that out. I, I think it was some kind of combination of the desire to project an image of courage when he wasn't willing to fight, um, they had, his wife had given birth to a daughter two months before, and they had lost their other, the infant born before she was born, and I think they might have been worried about traveling with the child. And I think he wanted to write about it, and that's my best guess. But it, he also probably underestimated the danger he was putting his family into, all of those reasons. Yes? When was it that he finally left Atlanta, and did his brother, Jabez, and his family go as well? Everyone else in the family left before Sherman got here. Um, they went to either Macon, where they had family, or Augusta, or Sparta, where the sister lived, or Americus, where another wing of the family was located. The parents left, the brother and his family left, everyone left. Sam left when he was forced to leave, and I think the exact date was September 24th. And he, he had to leave. He tried to parlay his pre-war unionism into an, oh, I was a unionist, but nobody was buying it, because he... <laughs> I mean, he owned the soldier's friend. He was trying to promote soldier morale. Just kidding. Yes, just kidding. Yes. Do you happen to 
Uh, well, there, there, there are pictures of him in the book. Um, he was, I think, an average height kind of a guy, like five, five or five, six, brown hair, full beard in middle age, um, slight. He was um, in good physical condition. He was an avid gardener throughout his life, and he did a lot of walking, and, and so he was a fairly fit kind of a guy, but not fit enough for military service <laughs> in his own mind. Yes. Um, he, he, he makes occasional notations of this. There's a lot of business history in this volume, and that's what I think makes it really interesting, too. He said usually goods, they were able to get about twice. The $28 pens costing so much, but that was extreme. Um, usually goods brought about twice what they had um, cost in the pre-war period. And he did complain that some people were making even more money. But books were not in the high demand kind of um, product. So the consumer was not willing to spend as much. Yes? Is there anything of much in this diary written by family members or anything, anyone? In his diary, no. His, uh, when he was courting his future wife, she kept a diary in the 1850s, and she kept it up for a brief, for a couple years, but sporadically after they were married. And then he took over its pages when paper became scarce. And part of the Civil War diary is written on the other half of her diary. So I was able to get a sense of her personality from looking at her earlier, uh, her diary, and incorporated that into my uh, introduction to this book. Unfortunately, I would love to know more about her personality. Uh, all I can do is get, get what I can take from his diary. And I was never successful in finding even an image of her. Uh, to, to include in my book, and I just decided I didn't want to spend years trying to track down a photograph, but it was disappointing to me that I never found a, an image of Mrs. Richards. I'm sure there's one out there. Yes? In what kind of uh, currency did Mr. Richards deal? Did he deal in Confederate dollars? He, oh, yes, he dealt in Confederate dollars. And he, um, he was, as he was getting ready to leave, he was able to talk somebody into changing out some Confederate money for some Yankee greenbacks, which was a good trade for Richards and not for the other guy. But he had most, he had a lot of assets tied up in Confederate bonds, all of it worthless. So they really did lose pretty much everything except the, the lots that they owned in the city. I also tried to track down what happened to his slave, and I couldn't find, you know, it's, it's just hard to track down African Americans. I looked to see if she showed up in the 1870 census, under perhaps the name of Ellen Richards, but she wasn't there. Yes? Was he bitter after the end of the war? He struggled to come to terms with it because he was genuinely a religious guy and he believed that everything that happened was God's will. And so he was forced to admit that this is what God had wanted, but he refused ever to acknowledge that he did not believe that the war was God's punishment for slavery. In fact, there was one article published in The Soldier's Friend that I found that, in, uh, you know, in which they spe the brothers speculated, if the war ends with the liberation of slaves, does this mean slavery was wrong? And the brothers concluded that no, it did not mean that. It meant just that slave owners were not as good at, as being slave owners. Um, and that, that was, you know, kind of their way of justifying it. But yet he, he did acknowledge that this is God's will, but he didn't have an easy time accepting it. Yes? Where was he buried? Where? At Oakland Cemetery. Oakland. Yes, he is at Oakland, and I have seen his grave. It's a very um, plain grave, along with his wife, at least one of their daughters, and Jabez Richards. Sam brought out his brother Jabez in the 1880s to go into business with his uh, adult sons, and Jabez Richards was married five times, and at least four of the wives, and maybe all five of them, died of tuberculosis. Isn't that incredibly sad? I mean, the man had just a tragic life. And I, I even asked a friend of mine who's an infectious diseases doc if possibly he could have been a carrier without, without getting the disease himself. And she said, no, this is not like typhoid. He, he could have had the disease, but there's no ev evidence he did. But he buried five wives. So Jabez is there at Oakland with all five of his wives. And, a variety, and the, both of the parents, uh, William uh, Richards Sr. and Ann Richards, are also buried at Oakland Cemetery. Yes? 
I don't know, ex you know if he supported them financially, but certainly he remembered the Confederacy with fondness and believed that it had been a worthy cause and that men had died valiantly. His brother-in-law, his wife's brother, um, James Dunbar Van Valkenburg, was the colonel of the 61st Georgia, died at the Battle of Monocacy. Some of you may be familiar with that regiment. And they found out the news about his death, you know, right as everything was heating up in Atlanta. And, it was, and another one of, of Sally Richards' brothers was um, wounded in the arm. So, I mean, there were lots. They had family um, trials and tribulations, as did every white family in Atlanta. Um, and then there's another dynamic that I didn't go into for lack of time, is that the, uh, the oldest brother was a public, an outspoken public unionist. And so there's that dynamic in this diary. And the rest of the family, the artist brother was non-political. He just didn't get it. He was, lived in New York but didn't take a stand. But the oldest brother was a prominent minister and public speaker and writer. And he was giving sermons and speeches published in newspapers in support of the union. And so this process of family reconciliation is a very interesting one to follow in this diary as well. I mean, deep-seated anger on the part of this unionist brother. Yes? Um, he didn't say that much, I mean, comparatively. He did, he was more likely to just mention going to hear people speak than really um, speaking in depth about what they said. Um, he was, his hero, his political hero was Alexander Stevens. And the fact that Alexander, see, he had met Stevens for the first time very early on, I want to say the 1840s, when um, Sam was peddling books and uh, Stevens was on vacation in Warm Springs, Georgia. And they met for the first time, and like everybody who met Alexander Stevens for the first time, uh, Sam Richards was kind of astounded at how physically un unattractive he was, but how impressive he was in every other way. And he could really speak, and Sam uh, loved to hear him speak uh, when he came to Macon. And it, in fact, it was Stevens's unionism that helped hold Sam in, in that mode for, I think, as long as he held him in there. And so when Stevens would come to Atlanta and speak, he would go hear him. And he also heard Hal Cobb um, speak, various other people, but he was more likely to just say he'd been than really talk and talk about how big the crowd was rather than talk about um, Reconstruction. Oh, he did condemn the radical Republicans for impeaching Andrew Johnson. I, he did get into that a little bit. But mostly he focused on his business career. Yes? He uh, lived a long life. Very long. Did he, uh, for People in his family lived a long time. His parents lived until the 1870s. His, uh, his siblings all lived until the 1890s. He did outlive most, though not all, of his siblings. And he probably didn't know, but he, he, I, I, mean, I can tell you from reading his diary that he enjoyed good health his entire life, probably because of a combination of, of good genes and the fact that he was an avid gardener and an outdoorsman. He liked to walk. Um, his wife, who was almost a decade younger than he was, died in 18, 1906, and her death, which was very sudden, just flattened him because they were so devoted to one another. Yes? You haven't mentioned any ostracism. I don't know if people really were that much aware of his draft dodging. And, you know, by making this contribution to the soldier's friend, he was able to, you know, say, here's what I did. And, you know, he was certainly not alone in avoiding. I mean, Sidney Root was not in the Army. Uh, lots of people were not in the Army. So he was able to parlay his, his general support and the fact that his brother-in-law was martyred at the Battle of Monocacy and so on uh, into... And, and he was a leading citizen of Atlanta. I mean, this bookstore got up and running immediately after the war, and he emerges as an important citizen. Yes? Uh, was, was Atlanta the state capital in those days? And no, it was Milledgeville. Um, I think Peachtree Street. Didn't Peachtree? Okay. And his, his bookstore was on Whitehall which is kind of where, if I understand correctly, where Peachtree kind of ends, and then on the other side of what is today underground Atlanta, is that right? Peachtree was extended. Peachtree was extended? So, okay. Why to come Okay, so, um, Mill but Milledgeville was the state capital during the Civil War. Yes? 
Yes. Did, did he offer any uh, personal observations of um, General Sherman or other prominent uh, Union figures? Like, did he see, see them in public? He did not mention seeing General Sherman in public. He, you know, he thought he was awful, of course. Um, he, he did mention when Sherman visited Atlanta, was that 1879 or something? He, he offered, a, he did write about that in his diary. You know, Sherman came here in, 18, I think it was 1879, and he wrote something a little bit snide about General Sherman coming to town and see how we have builded up what he destroyed in 1864. Yes? Conversely, did he have any editorial comments about Joseph E. Johnston or John Bell Hood? He seemed to think that it was fine that John Bell Hood was placed in command because he thought John Bell Hood was going to do something. I mean, I think a lot of people had that sense. You know, here's a fighting general, and I, I don't think Sam really knew that much about military stuff, so he, he was wrong, 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 as we know, on that one. But he did talk about Johnston. He, he had confidence in Johnston, but then he thought that the change was needed, and uh, so he hoped for the best from Hood. Yes? What was his religion like? He was deeply, deeply religious, but such a slave uh, only uh, supporter. Well, it's hard for us today to, to, to understand this. It, you know, he, yes. He just believed that because slavery existed in the Old Testament, that that made it okay. And, of course, it was in his economic interest to, to believe that. And so that's the way he justified it. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to get your hands around and, uh, today. And I, I tried as, an, as the editor of this to really n not forgive something like this, but to understand the world that he lived in. Uh, and, and so, of course, you walk a fine line. You don't want to forgive something that was clearly wrong, but at the same time, you don't want to say how, you know, it's not, the 21st century is not the 19th century. It was a different world then. And, but he never, he certainly remained a racist for the rest of his life. I mean, I don't get any sense that that ever changed. Are there any other questions? Okay. One more. Let's take one more up there. Okay. Yes. Could you comment on the, his writing style, the depth observations, um, just what the writing itself reveals about the person and the history he's doing it? Oh, that's a good question. These are all good questions. He, he, he was not very consistent in his grammar and spelling, I can tell you that. And trying to you know, spell it exact, record it exactly as he did was a, an ongoing challenge for me. There were times when he was very, um, I mean, he's a business guy, so a lot of times it's just to the point. And the weather is this, and my wife gave birth to an eight-pound child at this hour of the day, and it's very, you know, kind of recording. And then there are other times when he can be quite eloquent, like the, um, the and I, I think he just felt em emotion and passion when he went to see those graves at Oakland Cemetery. So I think he was a man with um, many complexities, as are all human beings, and he certainly never thought, I mean, I think he would be astounded if he thought that his diary was being published. I mean, he would just be, for one thing, the man doesn't come off particularly well in his own diary in some ways, so you know that this has a ring of, of truth to it. I mean, he could be pretty prickly and so on and so forth. So you get a sense of a very complex, multi-layered human being in this diary. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question.